Hi and welcome to part two in my series on continuum mechanics. The focus today is going to be on invariance of different quantities that we need to formulate stress strain equations, continuum mechanics style equations. And um, so let's start, let's talk about the goal here. The goal is really to enable you to read uh, equations and documentation for different material models and understand a little bit what's going on. So here's a website from the Polymer FEM, a website about the Bergstrom voice model. And here are some tensorial equations and how the stresses and strains are calculated. At the end of this lecture series that I'm putting together, I hope that you will be able to understand this and in a little better depth uh, to what's going on with these equations. So that's what I want to talk about. In order to do that, I will try to introduce the concepts that are needed, but I, I'm not trying to cover everything that's possible, obviously. I want to, in fact, do the opposite. I want to talk about only the key features that you need to really understand and try to skip some of the other things that are fun, perhaps, but not necessarily needed to achieve this goal. So. Last time in part one of my series, I jumped right into kinematics. I defined the deformation gradient as the partial derivative of the current position with respect to the initial position. And this is then a, a second order tensor that describes this deformation. Uh, in order to move forward, we need to learn how we can manipulate these quantities, these deformation gradients and how we can work with them. So that requires a little bit of a background in math. So today, the focus is a little bit math heavy perhaps, but I wanted to introduce some of the key concepts so you are somewhat familiar with that until we then move on to talk about stresses and strains. First though, let's cover a little bit about references. I am certainly not gonna go through everything that can be said about this topic. So if you wanna learn more, I recommend the following two books. One is the book that I wrote, Mechanics of Solid Polymers. The other one is a book by Holsapfel. And these are great introductory books on this topic that contains way more information that I can cover here today. So check that out if you're interested in learning more. So what I want to do today though is start very basic. I want to start by talking about vectors. A vector, as we all remember, is, is um, a, a, a quantity that can be described like this. There are basis vectors and then they have components in these basis directions. And that's just a, a third um, sort of a vector in three-dimensional space. The, often when we write these equations, we use a summation uh, rule as shown on the right here. When you have a subscript that's repeated in a quantity, that's being summed over. So that's the summation uh, uh, rule that, that I will use here as well. So I is a subscript that's repeated, so I should be summed over, and that's what's done here if you haven't seen that before. It's a very common way to write the equations a little bit shorter and more, uh, make it easier to follow. Uh, vectors can be multiplied in many different ways. Here are the three common ways that we will need to cover in this discussion. The first one is a dot product. It's very basic. You take one vector and dot multiply it with another one. That becomes a scalar. It's the sum of the individual uh, components as shown here. There's something called a cross product. A cross product is another vector, and that vector will be orthogonal to the two uh, vectors that were given. And it's from the determinant of this kind of quantity here, you work it out, you get uh, the vector direction. Uh, if you haven't seen this before, this can be written in shorter form using this permutation tensor that I'm not gonna really talk about more. I just wanna mention it here if you see that in some documentation. Um, the, the last part of vector multiplication that I will talk about is the dyadic product. Perhaps you haven't seen this too much. You can uh, create a dyadic product of two uh, vectors and that becomes a second order tensor or a three by three matrix with components just like shown here. So that's a, a handy quantity to use in many cases and this is the definition of it. Let's move over to tensors which are really just three by three matrices in this context. They are higher order tensors, but we won't talk about that right here. So here is a three by three matrix with these components. You can multiply a tensor in many different ways. One particular common way is to multiply a second order tensor with a vector. And if you do that, you get that matrix vector multiplication, which then becomes another uh, vector. So the, the idea here is that operating with a tensor A onto a vector U, will give you another vector. So the, the, the word that I like to use here is that a 
tensor of this kind is a linear operator. It can transform from one place to another. So that's another way to describe it. It's a matrix multiplication, but it's also a linear transformation or operator. Um, to multiply tensors, it's very basic. You cannot multiply a, a tensor with another tensor. So these are three three by three matrices. Becomes another three by three matrix. So it keeps the shape when you do that. I didn't write out all the components. You can do it if you're interested. Becomes pretty long. So I didn't really fit it here, so I skipped that. The individual components of that tensor multiplication, the ij component, is given by this equation at the bottom. So the short form of writing it is the final form here. And k is uh, repeated, so k would be a quantity that's summed over. And that's what we see to the left. There's another thing that's useful in uh, writing equations for finite element simulations and material models. That's the inner product of tensors. I will use them with a colon, as you see here. And that is given by this. It becomes a scalar number uh, given by these components, as you show here. So it's basically the sum of all the terms. Um, and uh, another concept that maybe you haven't seen if you haven't done this before is that you can decompose tensors to other forms. And this is very useful. Uh, one particular way of doing this that, that we will use a lot is you divide the tensor A in this case into deviatoric part and a volumetric part. And um, the, the, this down here, you see the definition of these. Particularly the deviatoric part is what drives the viscoplastic flow in many materials, the deviatoric part of the stress that is. So it's good to have these definitions in mind. This one removes the pressure the volumetric part, if A would be a stress, this will be a pressure type term. Um, finally, at the bottom here, if you want to have a, a tensor A and you want to find the components, the IJ component of the tensor, you can actually create that using this type of operation at the bottom. You take A, you multiply it by a unit vector in the I direction, and you dot pro product that with a unit vector in the J direction. That gives you the component in the IJ uh, value. So let's bring this back a little bit to deformation gradient now. So from the beginning, I talked about this definition. So I'm not going to go over this definition again. This is the partial derivative of the current position with respect to original position. We can rewrite this as follows. So d lowercase x, lowercase means current position, f times d capital X, which is the original position. So again, we see that f is a linear operator that uh, transforms or maps this unit vector, or this small vector here, to this vector. So it's a mapping or transformation of the material in that way if f is the deformation gradient. Similarly, you can show and you can kind of argue that in your head if you think about it a little bit. This is how linear line elements trans, uh, transform with f. Therefore, the determinant of f will transform the volume change, dw, d, d, v, from the current configuration to final configuration uh, as the lowercase v. So the determinant of f, the deformation gradient, is often called j. So that's the quantity that we often use in the equations when we calculate stress, the pressure particularly. Of course, j is the volumetric change uh, that's caused by the deformation gradient f. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on. Um, the final concept that I want to talk about here today is a very important one, and this uh, the concept of invariance and eigenvalues. This is really uh, important for writing equations and understanding sort of the basis of equations uh, that are used in continuum mechanics and constitutive equations. And this is something you may have seen in linear algebra when you studied that. So if you have a tensor A here, and uh, uh, if you multiply A operating on some vector, in some cases, you may get the same vector back that is multiplied by lambda i. So lambda will be the eigenvalue and will be the eigenvector in this particular case. For this to hold, if you want to find out what these uh, lambdas are, for example, we can just move this over to the left-hand side. And this is then the equation we get right away. For this to be true, for the different eigenvectors, eigen that is, then uh, the only non-trivial solution is if this is zero. So this uh, is not always zero. We don't want it to always be zero. So this has to be zero. So this is the equation that we want to solve. Uh, this matrix on the left-hand side is singular because it becomes zero. And if it's singular, 
that's, its determinant has to be zero. And that gives us this equation here. This is the characteristic equation of the A uh, matrix or tensor. And this is an equation with a third order polynomial in the lambdas. We can solve this to get the I values that give you the eigenvalues and invariants in this case. So these are the three invariants that come from this. And this is very important for hyperelasticity. If we use a deformation style matrix A here, we can find these invariants, which then are used to formulate the energy equations in hyperelasticity. And I may talk about that in a future video, but that's kind of how this goes. These are very important because they are independent of rotations, and which is obviously important when we want to formulate an equation for how energy deforms, the, depends on deformation. It should be independent of the rotations. Um, final slide here, spectral composition. Um, so we start back with this eigenvalue, uh, eigenvector equation. We want to really try to understand this a little bit more, and we want to write it in the form that I call the spectral decomposition. And this is very useful, actually. It may look complicated, but it has some value in it. You can understand a little bit more, particularly when we apply this concept to the deformation gradient and, and quantities like that. And I will talk about that in my next video in this series. So um, let's start here on the right. So if A here, if the, the tensor that I want to study is symmetric, then we know that it has a real valued eigenvalue. So they're real, they're not complex numbers, they're real values, and the eigenvectors form a orthogonal basis. And that's always true because uh, A is symmetrical. You can play with this if you like MATLAB. I wrote the MATLAB equations here, V, comma, D from the eigenvalue uh, calculation in MATLAB. And then V times D times inverse V becomes the same value as A. And that's really written in the middle equation here. Uh, that is, we have this um, quantity um, that gives us that. And this, in this case, these are all three by three matrices. We can show that the equation here is true by manipulating the bottom equation here. So here's the capital lambda is simply given by the equation uh, inside the square brackets here. Um, that's the definition of lambda. And then what we can do, if you think about it, you can actually realize that you can move the Q values from outside the summation to inside the summation in this dyadic product equation here. So this is the summation of the eigenvalues and this Q operating on the uh, unit vector becomes another vector, and that vector is the eigenvector, in this case, Ni. So Ni uh, cross here, Ni, gives us the A tensor again. And we will use this in the next lecture, in the next discussion about deformation gradient and how we can apply this, and that will give us a lot of insight into stresses and strains and the different definitions that are available for that. But I will stop here. So you have something to think about, and I will come back and follow up this discussion in the next video. If you have any questions for now, you can always ask them below.